This podcast may not be suitable for young listeners. Steve Lilly, journal entry number two. I met Tina at the Mexican buffet. It's my ritual on Friday nights after work to head home. I play with Lily for an hour and take a shower and head to the buffet. They know me there. I have plenty of friends and I could spend time with them. They're always doing something on Friday night, especially the singles crowd like me, but I prefer my solitude. At work, I stick to myself and I do my own thing. Everyone knows this about me and they leave me alone. If I have to work under a team leader on a project for an extended length of time, I wind up getting pissed off within a day or two. Slows everyone down, especially me. If I work alone, I'm happier and I'm faster. I guess I'm a loner. She was in front of me at the buffet loading her plate up like she hadn't eaten in a week. I backed up to look at her figure and she was slim. Quite a beauty, really and we both moved on. How do some people eat that much and never gain a pound? I'll never get it. Before Bigfoot hunting became the money train, I ate like a pig. I never gained much weight, but there were mornings the jeans required extra effort to button, and the day was miserable, feeling like I was a water balloon with a rubber band strapped around me. Bigfoot hunting was physical work. I didn't need to be an Olympic athlete, but I didn't need to be slow either. So watching my diet helped me remain quick on my feet. But Friday was the day that I let my hair down and I ate a gluttonous meal. She looked at me while we were in line. She'd stop at a dish and study it for a minute and then look back at me and smile and then take another step to the next pile of food. Well, I liked her smile, but soon became annoyed. I was hungry and, what the hell, girl? It's a pan of refried beans. Move along. But through the annals of history, even the best, most focused men will become enthralled with a woman's smile. It's the eyes, I think. It is for me. So the annoyance turned to fascination, and she was on my mind now. When I got to my table, I had forgotten about her, and I dug into the steak chimichanga I had on my plate. I was in my once-per-week sweep spot. I finished the item and was ready to move to a pile of fajita chicken when I raised my head from the feeding trough to wipe my mouth and I saw her having a waitress move her dishes and drink to the table next to me. Well, now that was odd. I don't know where she'd been sitting before and I assumed she was with friends or a man when I first saw her. But now she sat all alone to my right facing me at the adjacent table. She looked over and she smiled, showing those pretty whites and said that she had been cold in the other spot. This area was warmer and she could enjoy her meal without the blast of the air conditioning on her. Yep, I nodded and kept eating. I am a non-assuming man. I learned a long time ago to never assume that a woman is interested in me unless she pretty much throws herself at me. This is exactly what happened next. She asked me a question or two to get me talking, and when I answered with my usual short responses, she asked if she could sit across from me at my table. She had thrown herself at me, and the night was ruined, but it was ruined by a nice and very attractive woman. I was almost finished and feeling quite full, so I thought, what the hell? I was about to head out anyway. She talked about everything under the sun, and I didn't get many words in, not that I wanted to, but she was a blabbermouth. I tried to get up three times, and she was the master of keeping a conversation going. I didn't know nor care where this was going, and I was ready to get home and get back to a good novel I had started earlier in the week, but she kept talking. Well, I was saved by the bell, as they say. A text message had come through, and I looked at it. I felt her frustration as I looked at my phone. I stood up and I said I had to go. It was an emergency. Tina frowned and quickly wrote something on a napkin and stuffed it in the front pocket of my Levi's as I walked by. 
I thought that to be strange at the time, and I didn't know it was a phone number until she lit up that gorgeous smile and said, You're going to call me, right? I mumbled something stupid and headed to pay my bill. As I walked away, I heard her say something to the effect of that I better call her. Well, that made me turn, and I swear something had changed in her eyes. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I detected an evilness in her smile and eyes. Oh, what the hell, I thought. She seems nice enough. If I ever get time. I had more important things to do now. I paid my bill and quickly walked to the truck. By now, the organization I worked for had issued us a laptop. There was an app that would give me a live satellite feed. There were several modes, one being thermal. That meant we could now see anything on the ground with a different body temperature than the surrounding area. Well, I opened it, and there was an icon on the screen blinking. It was the only icon on the screen. Nothing else was on this computer. Well, I clicked it, and I opened the file. These files would remain available to me for 72 hours. In the folder were various bits of intelligence, maps and thermal images and witness reports, transcripts from debriefings of previous ventures by the office to the area, and recordings of 911 calls, etc. After 72 hours, the files vanished from the machine. We didn't get to keep the files for our records. The office needed deniability. That was my guess. I didn't care one bit. I headed home and loaded my gear and headed south to a town in the Mississippi Delta called Rosedale. My targets weren't in Mississippi. They were across the river in Arkansas. The White River in Arkansas begins at Bull Shoals Lake in the northeast corner of the state, and it dumps into the Mississippi River close to Rosedale. There was no need to drive all the way over into Arkansas when I could cross the river at Rosedale in my boat. So, with my boat in tow, I headed south. It was now 10.30 p.m. Over the last month, several reports were made to local wildlife officials and to law enforcement of huge hairy creatures attacking fishermen in small boats. Everyone had been able to escape the rampaging animals except the last one. There had been no report for a squatch attack, but two men from Greenville had been fishing in that area and had been missing for two days. The search for the men was ongoing, which would screw things up for me. I liked and I needed to do my work alone. All the activity would push the squatches back into the woods. None of this was good news, but one thing had become available that was worth gold to me. With the click of a button inside the folder, I could bring up a real-time thermal image of the area. When I looked at it before I left, I could see boats trolling the area. Obviously, the search crews were looking for the missing men. There are never that many boats on that water at night. And then, in a location in thick timber, I saw three hits reflecting heat. I zoomed in, and one large figure was moving while the other two lay on the ground. It was a squatch and the two men. I had no doubt. I knew exactly where to go so that I could avoid the traffic running up and down the waterway. By 2 a.m., I was at full throttle heading north on an oxbow that would dump me in the Mississippi River. And from that point, I would head back south, cut in on a small chute that would get me to the closest point. The rest would be on foot, and that's when things would get tense. But I was getting good at this, not in a cocky way. I had learned how these filthy animals operate. I would soon find out this shithead was not your average squatch, though. Pulling the boat up on the bank, I covered it with brush so that the search teams wouldn't notice it. I walked into the timber through ankle-deep mud and opened the laptop. I needed to see that the three figures were still there, and they were. But one of the men looked smaller. That meant one of two things. The Squatch had eaten half of him for supper, or he was either standing or hung in a tree. Neither prospect was good. The heat signature was strong enough that I thought he was still alive. It's a preferred method of these thugs of the animal world to immobilize their catch 
and if they're dead, to tenderize the meat by hanging them in a tree. I was going to do my best to get those Mississippi boys home, but I wasn't sure I could get there soon enough. If you let me digress a bit, you will hear this many times in upcoming journal entries. You want that squatch to come to you, and you want to piss him off. This is not an activity for the skittish. A man in these situations has to stand firm and use his wits and make decisions from instinct or follow the plan. Always follow the plan until you can't. Things will go haywire. I can say for a fact that when one of these alphas is bearing down on you, it is no fun. One mistake in your squatch breakfast. You want him angry because that's when they charge you. If he is merely curious, well, they just sneak around and they watch you. You never know where they are. So the trick is to find out whatever it is that will make him blow his top, and then the game is on. In this case, I knew where the squatch was. He knew where I was, too. At this point, I was watching him from 350 miles overhead. He was already standing at the edge of the nest, and he was looking my way. These images are so good that I could see him lifting his head in the air and sniffing for the foreign odor that had just entered his territory. Either that or he had heard me pull the boat up on the bank and all the noise I made cutting brush to hide my boat. I wasn't a rescue team trolling the water looking for a missing fisherman. I was on dry land, and he knew it. He heard me, he could smell me, and he was coming. In almost any case with an advancing enemy, you want to get around on them. It is the same with hunting wild game. Never meet them head on. You have to flank them and wind up in a position they don't expect. I was moving to my right, which was his left, at a pretty good jog. He was moving too, and that meant he couldn't hear me. When I came to the position so that he was heading straight for the boat, he would be moving from my right to my left. I could open fire on him and cripple him up a bit, and then when he charged, unleash several rounds of buckshot and put him down. I flipped my night vision on, and I waited. He should have crossed my line of fire within 50 yards, but he didn't. My field of view was good. I should have seen him by now, clicking my goggles with my fingers to make sure they were operating correctly, and I found that they were. Where was this dumb son of a bitch? Thirty minutes passed and nothing but crickets. Had he heard me moving and worked his way behind me? You never know. Wild game is that way. I have had big boss jelly heads, that's a turkey, goblin in front of me, and then they'd go silent for an hour or two. Well, you sit there and you wait and you wait. All of a sudden they thunder out a gobble behind you and scare the shit out of you. You can't kill them that way, because as soon as you move, you're made, and off they trot going to find more hens. No, if this squatch was making a move like that, he would have been on me by now. The laptop was back at the boat, so I couldn't check the satellite again. I need to put in for a request for a handheld unit. If they're available, that would be handy. I was in a bad position and getting a bit nervous, and there's nothing to rattle a man's nerves more than waiting on a killing machine to appear, and he doesn't. Now you are the hunted, and that realization weighed heavy on my mind. I knew he was watching. A thousand pounds of grab you by the neck and pop your head off was waiting on me to move. There is no doubt where we stood in this game of death chess. In these cases, and there have been a few like this in the past years, I needed to do something he least expected. And when you do that, it gives you time. Maybe only three to five seconds, but it's enough time to get a shot off or move into a better position. When the hunt has stalled, you always have the element of surprise in your pocket. He expected me to be creeping, and that's exactly what I was not going to be doing. I burst out from behind the tree, and I ran like hell in the direction that I thought he would be. I was only ten long strides into this insane tactic, and that's when I figured out where he was. He was right above me in the trees. 
I wouldn't have known he was there but for the limbs and the leaves raining down on me. A quick look straight up and I caught him about to drop on me. So I raised my AR-10 and I put three in his chest before he made the drop and at least two more while he was falling. When he hit the ground only a few feet from me, I put five more indiscriminately into his body. He was still moving, but I knew he was done. I was able to send one more into the brain cavity at that point, and the twitching stopped. Now here's the deal. I had sat there for 30 minutes. He had moved around behind me and somehow gotten up in that tree. I don't know if they moved from tree to tree, or if he climbed up the tree, he could have grabbed me if he was behind it. The night visions were flipped up and I switched on my headlamp to get a good look at him. This one was older than I expected and probably at the end of his prime. This explained the stealth he used to get the drop on me. The slower, weaker, and older ones learn to outwit you instead of to come at you with brute force. This one had some wisdom and sometimes they're the scariest. I dispatched the head with a machete and I carried it back to the boat. First things first, I was here to make money, not necessarily save two dumbass fishermen. But I did have an obligation to see what I could do for them. When I got to the nest, I held back a distance. I flipped my goggles down to make sure that none of the others had shown up. It was a good thing because I saw another squatch, probably a female, and she was pacing back and forth in the nest. It didn't appear she knew I was there. I was too far for a buckshot, and vegetation obscured a shot from my AR, so I moved as quietly as possible straight at her. Eventually, she would see me coming, and then she would charge, and that's what she did. I moved behind a big tree trunk to block her charge if I missed. I acquired her in my scope, and I started shooting. She went face down in the mud. There was no need for a kill shot. She was done. I quickly removed that head and stuffed it in a tote sack on my belt, and then I moved to the fishermen. I really did hope they were alive. You boys ready to get home? I said. They hadn't heard a human voice in several hours and probably didn't expect one until they heard me shooting. The one tied up in the tree said, I knew we were in good hands when I heard you shooting. I hope you killed every one of them motherfuckers. Well, I got two so far, I said. There might be more in the air, so we got to get moving. I said this and cut both of them loose. You have never seen two men happier to see another human in your life. One of them hadn't said a word. He just stood there crying and looking at me. Then he embraced me in the hug of thank you for showing up. I knew how he felt. I'd have done that too, so I hugged him back. You're going to be all right, brother, I said. I got you. Can you handle a shotgun? Give it to me, he said. I want to crack at those things. You got another one? Asked the other. I unstrapped my 1911 and handed it to him, and he grinned at me. I had some killers on my hands, and I was glad of it. I heard a call come from my west. It was one of those howls those creatures make when they're calling for others. I assumed the howls were for the two older squatches I'd already killed. We needed to head east to get back to the boat. It had taken an hour to get where I stood. At a good run, we could make it back to the boat in 30 minutes, but that was 30 minutes I had to keep these boys moving and alive. We gotta go now, I said. You see that line I'm pointing at through here? You see that big oak tree? Head that way as fast as you can run. And you'll dump out at my boat. I'm going to cover our rear. I'll be right behind you, and I need you to shoot anything that moves. There's nothing in these woods but those creatures. Do you got me? They looked worried now and stood still staring at me. Boys, you got to go now, I said, and I nudged them that way. They started at a slow jog and then picked up the pace. I turned my attention back to the source of the howls. The crisp sound of the trees breaking and water splashing was indiscernible now. I didn't know how many we were dealing with. This is when the haywire ensues. All plans go to shit in a fight like this. The most important thing you can do is keep moving. Even when the ammo runs out, keep moving. The minute you stop or lay down, that's when it's over. 
With those thoughts in mind, I charged toward the squatches. I think I was lucky because I would later find that the three that were coming were young ones. One was a female and there were two males and they were coming hard. And when they do this, it's easy to see them. I had a good target and I started taking them out. The female was first. She was 40 yards out coming fast on two legs. Two rounds to the cranium put her down. The teenager to my right had made it to 30 yards. Four quick rounds to the chest and he went down. He wasn't dead, but he wasn't getting up. I swung to my left thinking the last one was right on me, but he wasn't there. And I scanned all the way around 360 degrees and I never saw him, but I knew he was there somewhere. I knew it. I kept moving. Remember that? Keep moving. Just keep moving. But I couldn't leave those bounties to rot in the woods, so I did the quickest butchering job I had done up until that night. With four heads in my sack, I was carrying a heavy load, but if I didn't have those, this would have been a wasted trip. After dropping the mag and slamming a fresh one in, I turned and was heading east to the boat at a dead run, squatch heads dragging behind me. I expected to be caught at any minute by number three, but it never happened. I was watching my flanks the whole way because that's where he'd come from, but nothing but dark woods on each side, so I kept moving. The boat was a short distance in front of me. The two fishermen were there, and they had found a light in my boat. They were giving me a homing beacon of light, and I appreciated that. After correcting my course slightly, I went into full sprint. I was halfway to the boat. To my left, I saw the white splashes from the last squatch glistening in the moonlight. He was running, and he would beat me to the boat. I stopped, and I pulled up, and I sent every round I had left in that thing. I may have hit him once or twice, but it wasn't enough to slow him down. He was going to make it to the men at the boat and tear him to pieces. I just knew it, and my heart sank. A shotgun blast in the woods is loud and it is unmistakable, but the 45 ACP coming out of a 1911 pistol will hurt your eardrums if you are only a short distance from the report. We never know how much louder a gun is on the front end because we're always behind it when we shoot, but when you're on the front, it's a whole different sound. I was at an angle that put me on the muzzle blast end of these guns. And by the time I was within sight of these men, they had opened up on that last squatch. The trees in front of them lit up with every shot fired, and I think I watched that massive squatch go down in slow motion. It was the strobe light effect, actually, and it looked pretty cool. When I got to them, they were empty. They shined the light on the beast, and he was a goner. I didn't waste a second. I was on that squatch like white on rice with my machete, and in four strokes I had another head in my hand. What the hell are you doing? asked one of the fishermen. It's a long story, I said. I walked past them both and threw the heads in the boat. They started to climb in, and I stopped them, and they looked confused, and rightly so. I explained as best as I could that I could not be seen here. I explained that I had saved their lives and they needed to do this for me. It took a few minutes, but they seemed to finally understand, and then I handed them a flare. Light it up when I pull out of here. You boys got that? I said. Wait, one of them said. What if more of those creatures come? What are we supposed to do? There are boats all up and down this area looking for you, I said. I hear one now. Now light that flare. And they'll see it, and they'll be here in a few minutes. Those creatures are done. I don't know if we got them all, but they won't bother you now. You can tell this story when this is all over, but I recommend that you make another story up if you want to stay out of the mental ward. No matter what you say, they will not believe you. Now listen, I gotta go. You boys have a good life. They nodded, and then they thanked me, both begging me for my name or my phone number or something. They wanted to show their gratitude later, but I couldn't do that. I always did everything possible to stay as low-key as circumstances allowed, and I believed they would cover for me and make up a story. And to this day, I have never heard another thing about those two men. 
but I know that when I was a quarter mile down the chute, I saw that flare glowing on the bank. It lit up the whole island. As I turned the corner into the oxbow, spotlights hit the area, and I knew those boys were safe. I was home in the trailer park an hour after sunrise. I made the call reporting five kills. The exchange was scheduled for that evening at 8 p.m., remarkably in a location in East Memphis. I cleaned up and I went to bed. I was back up at 6 p.m. and I got dressed and I headed on to Memphis. I arrived at the office building on Germantown Road by 8 o'clock where we made the exchange. I was still making $5,000 per head at that time and drove away with $25,000 cash in an Adidas bag. Now this had been a good day and I was feeling it. A few hours of sleep and a bag full of money and a whole day off tomorrow. It don't get much better than that. I punched in a Jimmy Buffett CD and I settled into the seat for the drive home. The napkin fell from the visor with Tina's number on it and I thought about it for a minute. I didn't have any place to be and the night was young. Maybe she would be up for a few beers at the pub. I pulled over and punched the number in on that burner I kept with me in case I ever needed it. No reason for her to have my main phone number just yet. She was happy to hear from me and was delighted to go out, have a few cold ones and listen to some live country music. She only needed an hour to get ready and I could pick her up. Of course I could do that. And the weekend was getting better by the minute. She met me at the door. Man, did she look good. An awesome looking top draped over jeans that fit just right. And there was that pretty smile and those pretty eyes. I was swept off my feet. I was ready for some beers. We left the place at midnight and the conversation had been okay, I guess. But a few things bothered me. She already assumed that we were a thing. I had never even mentioned that and I told her so. No matter, she said, once I met her family, I would be hooked. They were real nice people, and I distinctly remember telling her at least twice that I wasn't looking for a relationship. My work wouldn't permit it, and there was no way I could keep a woman happy the way I worked. But once again, she said it didn't matter and that she would grow on me. It was at that point I knew I wouldn't be calling this beauty again. I acted like I was tired and I said it had been a long weekend and that I needed to get home to check on my dog. Oh, she loved dogs, she said. She didn't have one, but she looked forward to having Lily in her house. Well, that sealed the deal and I was done with this one. When I pulled into her drive, she invited me inside. I knew what she wanted and that was not my intention, but she stayed after me for a minute or two and I had to relent. The next two hours were enchanted, to put it mildly, but as I told her before, I needed to get home. Now, fully dressed and halfway out the door, she stopped me and she planted a big wet kiss on me, and she handed me a $50 bill saying that she was hungry and for me to go get us a pizza and be back in an hour. Well, in my mind, I was thinking, how could I have ever been more clear with this woman? But that didn't matter now. I was outside and headed to my truck. She stood in the light of the porch with her robe and blew me a kiss, telling me to hurry back. She was starving. Hurry, she said. Hurry back. Well, I wanted that $50 bill in my shirt pocket, and I drove home. There is no woman alive that's going to control Steve Lilly. The next morning, I saw the light blinking from the burner on my kitchen table. Tina was the only person who had that number. I opened it and saw a text message that read, You're a son of a bitch. Before I pulled the SIM card out and threw it in the trash, I sent her a text back that read, You sure got that right. Mm-hmm.